Before we begin, anyone who forgot to turn off their cell phones, please do so now. And please hand in your questions you would like to ask the panel to members of staff who are circulating around, and they will do so through the film. It's a very special pleasure to welcome Atlanta neighbors to the Carter Center, as well as several friends from across the United States. As you know, the center's programs in peace and health are mostly overseas in Africa, Latin America, China, the Middle East. This work would not be possible without generous help from many of you who are here with us tonight. Carter Conversations afford us an opportunity to thank you for your support and encouragement and we encourage you to engage in the center in other ways. You can stay abreast of all Carter Center activities on our recently revamped website, cartercenter.org. Our website also offers a convenient way to contribute financially to the center, for which we're always grateful. Now, before I start sounding like a host for Public Radio's fall fundraising campaign, <laughs> let me briefly, briefly introduce tonight's conversation. This is the second of three Carter Center conversations of the fall season. The topic, a moment of crisis, North Korea, is certainly a timely one. Any media present should know that we scheduled this event long ago without access to any secret intelligence or forecast of North Korean action. Probably safe to say that the only ones toasting this test are in Pyongyang and Marion Creekmore's publisher. Our four panelists tonight, President and Mrs. Carter, Ambassadors Laney and Creekmore, exemplify what our Executive Director, Dr. John Hardman, calls the Carter Center's four A's. Action, access, academic excellence. All four of our panelists hold special academic appointments at Emory University, demonstrating their commitments to help develop the next generation of national and international leaders. President Carter, the hero of tonight's topic, co-founder of the Carter Center, enjoys the love and respect of all of us. The same is certainly true of our other co-founder, Mrs. Rosalind Carter. Together, they recently celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, the birth of their first grandchild. Great grandchild, great, great, no, one great. All grandchildren are great, but. And I should say that while the Carter Center is stri strictly nonpartisan, if staff could vote in Nevada's Senate race, Son Jack would get just over 100 <laughs> percent. Our third panel member is James T. Laney, former Emory president, Carter Center trustee. Dr. Laney is an expert on Korea, and as U.S. ambassador to South Korea, played a key role during the crisis that we'll be discussing tonight. Ambassador Laney's presence reminds us not to forget South Korea's enormous success as we focus on the failures in the North. For here are two states, side by side, populated by people of the same race, same culture, religious traditions, often from the same families, who emerged from World War II crippled in their military rule. The North is a country the size of Mississippi. It remains closed, autocratic, impoverished, unable to feed its own people where the average income is about $1,700 a year compared to over $20,000 a year in South Korea. South Korea has 25% less land, fewer natural resources, twice the population, but its economy is 25 times as big. A few days ago, as the UN unanimously sanctioned the North, it elected the South's Foreign Minister, Secretary General of the UN. Nowhere on earth is there a starker example of the value of access to liberal education international trade and cooperation, and the opportunity to be a democracy. Our fourth panel member, I think others might agree, I hope will agree, is the star of tonight's program. He's our moderator, Ambassador Dr. Professor Marion Creekmore, predecessor of mine here at the Carter Center, and author of a simply wonderful new book, A Moment of Crisis. If you want to know more about Marion's background, please buy the book and read about him in the dust cover. Copies are on sale in the library. There are, of course, other reasons, other more important reasons to buy the book, and let me just very briefly mention a couple of these. Uh, Marion Creekmore has produced a real-life thriller, as compelling, if less flamboyant, than an Ian Fleming, James Bond mystery. He has also produced 
He has also produced a superb scholarly work, meticulously researched and documented. I even enjoyed reading all of his 50 pages of footnotes, which highlight, and this is important, highlight the dedication of so many Foreign Service professionals and those at the Carter Center who behind the scenes made this enormous diplomatic undertaking a success. But the main value of the book is his dramatic account of how a master mediator, Jimmy Carter, actually does the hard work of diplomacy. President Carter went out on this particular diplomatic high wire without any government providing a safety net to catch him should he fail. We read how mistakes were made and corrected, whether as a result of miscommunication, sheer exhaustion, or just bad editing by media interviewers. And success demanded not only dealing with the inscrutable dictator Kim Il-sung, but also the dickering Democrats back in Washington, D.C., who backed his mission initially and then had second and thirds and further thoughts. So in short, this diplomatic gambit was a lot more complicated than even the controversy surrounding it suggests. Now we're going to watch a five-minute clip of CNN news stories from President Mrs. Carter's 1994 trip to North Korea. After that, Ambassador Creekmore will start and moderate our conversation. Please turn in any further questions to the staff during the film. I will be back after the panel discussion to ask as many of these questions as time allows. And as the film runs, I hope those of you who are so inclined will just take a moment and say a little prayer for a 2006 sequel to President Carter's 1994 diplomatic success in preventing war with North Korea. Thank you very much for your attention. But we begin with the situation in North Korea, specifically formal U.S. efforts underway now to impose U.N. sanctions against the North. A draft resolution is circulating among members of the U.N. Security Council. Its contents outlined by the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Stopping all technical and scientific cooperation that could contribute to North Korea's nuclear knowledge. The second, terminating all economic assistance uh, through the United Nations or its subsidiaries. The third is reducing the size and scope of diplomatic activities with North Korea, both bilaterally and through international organizations. Four, we'll be curtailing cultural, technical, scientific, commercial, and educational exchanges with North Korea, both in that country and elsewhere. And finally, prohibiting North Korea from exporting or importing any weapons or components of weapons. And that is mandatory. Now those proposed sanctions, the response to North Korea's repeated refusals to allow full inspections of its nuclear facilities. President Clinton says there is still time for North Korea to pursue an alternate path, one he says would be better for their own people. North Korea continues to stand firm in its refusal to open up its nuclear facilities, however. The North Korean defense minister said today his country would never again accept international inspections. Those words of defiance served as counterpoint to a mission of peace. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter arrived in North Korea today for an unprecedented visit aimed at defusing the crisis. CNN's Mike Chinoy is in the North Korean capital. The climax of Jimmy Carter's first day in Pyongyang, a lavish welcoming banquet where North Korea's foreign minister called for a peaceful resolution of the nuclear crisis. We believe that if the United States renounces its concept of confrontation with us, respects our national sovereignty, and treats our country on an equal footing, the nuclear issue will be resolved satisfactorily. In a brilliantly lit banquet hall, the two men exchanged toasts to the health of North Korean President Kim Il-sung, to the leaders of the United States government, and at Mr. Carter's suggestion, to freedom and human rights. Then the former president made his own call for an end to hostility. The time has come to establish full friendship and understanding, open trade, exchange of visits, and full diplomatic relations between our two countries. 
But Mr. Carter said that would not happen until North Korea provides some answers about its nuclear program. We're struggling now for a clear understanding about the full transparency of the nuclear program. I believe that as soon as this issue is resolved clearly and the misunderstandings are removed, that we can make progress toward the other goals that we share. It was a dramatic end to a day already filled with drama. In a half a century of tortured relations between the United States and North Korea, there has never been a scene like this. I would like to take this opportunity to pass to the Korean People's Army and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, President Carter, his wife, and their party for your safekeeping. A former American president crossing the world's most volatile front line, a mission of peace against the backdrop of growing fears of war. Mr. Carter arrived in a capital where the absence of war jitters stood in stark contrast both to North Korean rhetoric and the massive civil defense drills underway in South Korea. There was no sign of anything unusual in Pyongyang, and diplomats here report no evidence of heightened military activity, canceling of leave, repositioning of troops, or other preparations for conflict. But the nuclear crisis was high on the agenda at Mr. Carter's first formal meeting with Foreign Minister Kim, the former president spelling out his understanding of U.S. and international concerns, the North Korean official taking advantage of this opportunity to put their case to the most important American visitor this country has ever received. We've had very uh, thorough and interesting discussions about the nuclear issue and about other matters that are important uh, to my country and to North Korea, and we look forward to more definitive discussions uh, tomorrow. There is little expectation that Jimmy Carter's visit here will produce any kind of breakthrough. But in a situation where there are virtually no channels of communication between Washington and Pyongyang, the mere fact of his presence may be breakthrough enough. Mike Chinoy, CNN, Pyongyang. I'm Marion Creekmore, and I would like to express the appreciation of all of us for your presence tonight. I would like to also thank the Carter Center for making this event possible, uh, John Stremlow for his generous words about the book, and particularly to express my appreciation to the three distinguished people we have here on the stage, President Carter, Mrs. Carter, and Ambassador James Laney. These are the three most important people in the book that I've been privileged to write. They were highly instrumental in going beyond what we just saw Mike Tenoy say. He said that no one expected a breakthrough, but indeed there was a breakthrough. And because of President and Mrs. Carter's visit and some work that Jim was doing back in South <coughs> Korea, and then some follow-up by the Clinton administration, that North Korean nuclear weapons crisis of 1994 was resolved peacefully, and that was a crisis that could very well have led to the Second Korean War. Tonight, the way we will handle the program is that I will ask a few questions, but the purpose is to avoid, as, avoid the questions as much as possible and just have a free-flowing conversation uh, among all of us. 
Uh, we will structure the conversation so that we will talk first about the period before the visit, and then the visit itself, which took place on June the 15th, 1994, when the Carter team crossed the DMZ, as you saw on the, uh, uh, on the CNN report, came back on the following Saturday, June 18. Then we'll talk about after we got back into South Korea and then went to Washington where President Carter had a number of very important conversations. And finally, the Wednesday following when the North Koreans confirmed in diplomatic channels that indeed a peaceful resolution was possible. Uh, with that, let me just give you a few words of background to set the stage and then we will let our three distinguished guests do most of the talking from this point on. In 1994, the United States and other countries, as well as the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, knew that between 1989 and 1991, North Korea had reprocessed a small amount of plutonium. Plutonium, of course, is one of the ways that you can make a nuclear weapon. The United States and the IAEA, supported by South Korea and others, demanded that North Korea subject itself to special inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency so that the agency and the rest of the world could know precisely how much plutonium North Korea had. North Korea refused to allow those inspections. The U.S. had another concern. The five megawatt graphite moderated reactor that they had in operation had spent fuel in it that they wanted to discharge. That spent fuel, when discharged and cooled in cooling ponds, would be able to be, the plutonium would be able to be separated from it. And from that, five to six nuclear weapons worth of plutonium could have been produced. The United States, in those early months of 1994, took the issue to the United Nations Security Council seeking economic sanctions. At the same time, it augmented its military forces in and around the Korean Peninsula. North Korea stated both publicly and privately that it would regard the declaration of sanctions by the Security Council as a declaration of war and react accordingly. And then in May, of 1994, North Korea began to discharge its fuel rods into the cooling pond from which more plutonium could be extracted after the cooling period. This was the moment when former President Jimmy Carter, then citizen Jimmy Carter, decided that he needed to go to North Korea and see if he could not defuse this crisis. I'd like to start by asking two questions, first to Jim Laney and then to President and Mrs. Carter. Jim, can you tell us, since you were the American ambassador in South Korea at the time, can you tell us how the Clinton administration was trying to deal with this issue in the period of the several months before, as well as how was the South Korean uh, government working on this crisis with the North? And then I'd like to turn to President and Mrs. Carter and ask you to tell us about your interest in uh, the Korean Peninsula, the invitations you had received from the North Koreans, and most particularly, why you decided that you needed to go to North Korea. Jim? Well, first of all, uh, Marion, I want to add my own word of congratulations on the publication of this remarkable book. It's um, masterful and definitive and will stand a long time. And it's also very readable. I agree with John Strimlaw. And I would like to take this opportunity uh, before a local audience to uh, express my heartfelt appreciation to President Carter, who was instrumental, was the key person in seeing that I was named ambassador in 1993. And I want to make that very sincere, but also ironic because he dumped me into that mess that we got into. <laughs> Neither he nor I realized what an enormous crisis was looming. And it was only after I got there that I realized that uh, we were in a whirlpool and it was really, uh, looked like we were on our way to war. 
I would characterize the situation as being one in Korea, as they mention in the news, of uh, great anxiety, short of panic, but great anxiety. The um, American mothers had taken their children out of school in April, and they had gone home. There was kind of a slow, quiet evacuation. Um, the threats that had gone back and forth between North Korea and Washington increased in intensity and vitriol. The North Koreans had said, we will turn Seoul into a sea of fire, and they could because they had thousands of long-range artillery that had Seoul, a city of 12 to 15 million people, within range of their uh, shells. The United States had said, beginning with President Clinton, that if they tried to make a bomb and use it, that there would be no North Korea. He said that on the DMZ. And others had followed up with equally stern warnings. And every time the negotiations that uh, Marion had spoken about in terms of the uh, business about trying to get inspectors and the uh, United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency, every time they broke down, the tension ratcheted up another notch. Fortunately, I had a very good relationship with the commanding general there. We had breakfast every week. We shared our concerns, our assessments, our plans and thoughts. All We worked precisely together in step. There was not any daylight between us. And he and I both agreed, I relied, of course, upon his military assessment, that a war not only would be catastrophic, a second Korean war, but that it was foolish, it was unnecessary, that we had not exhausted all possibilities for trying to resolve this situation peacefully. But when I would go back to Washington, I could find no center where the decision was being made. I went from the State Department to the Secretary of Defense and to the National Security Council, and there were always committees, but I didn't know where the decision would be made for any kind of initiative. It all seemed reactive. And it was at that point that I uh, went to the chief of staff of the White House and said, look, we've got to have greater kinds of uh, uh, overtures to the north. And the response was, President Clinton, you know, is vulnerable on the issue of military service. And he's got to be tough. And any attempt to talk to the north would be seen as appeasement. At that time, the American press was full of columns calling for bombing of the North, of bombing the facility, that would be ready for war and so forth. And even the American people, the polls indicated that they would support military action against North Korea. And I said, well, it may be a political downside in terms of talking with the North, but if they have 50,000 body bags coming back to the United States, that's going to be a downside politically too. And it turned out that at that point, uh, that afternoon, uh, the White House called the uh, Secretary of State, Christopher, and he appointed Bob Gallucci to be the point man for, um, for North Korea. But the problem was, even with that, as marvelous and brilliant as Bob Gallucci was, there was no uh, willingness to take the initiative. Uh, at one point, we uh, tried to talk Senator Nunn and Luger into going as representatives of the government from the Senate. And they were prepared to go, but if the uh, trip fell through at the last minute. It was under those circumstances that uh, coming back to Atlanta for the Emory commencement in May, that I took the occasion to uh, share my concerns and, and alarms with uh, President Carter. We'd worked together in the Carter Center, and I felt very close to him and held him in such high esteem and knew that he was a peacemaker at heart as well as in his mind. And we talked about that and shared it, and um, as they say, the rest is history. Um, he said, do you remember, uh, he and I had talked about it before I went to Korea, that he had received an invitation from the leader of Korea, Kim Il-sung, to visit. And it hadn't worked out because of Washington, I guess. But he was going to check to see if that was possible. And it was, uh, uh, I think I left that meeting, President Carter, for the first time with some glimmer of hope that uh, if you would get involved, if that was possible for that to work out, that we might begin to 
to break the log jam, but it was a long shot and it was in your hands. But uh, I felt so much better. Uh, you have to realize that here was a neophyte ambassador with very little uh, foreign service experience, none at all, I might say, and going outside of government, uh, having given up, I shouldn't say this uh, so flatly, but th there were wonderful, bright people, but there was just no place where the, uh, the situation could be released. It was like two ships that were on a collision course, and none would, would uh, change course for fear that they would be seen as a, a coward or a peaser or a weak or something like that. And we really hadn't checked it out. And it was the need to have that face-to-face -face that, that was so important. And that's where the Carters come in. Well, beginning in 1991, uh, Kim Il-sung, the dictator of uh, North Korea, whom I really despised because I had been in a submarine force during the Korean War. And I had seen, in retrospect, 56,000 of my fellow people in the armed forces killed in that war. But uh, beginning in 1981, he began to send me messages that somehow or another, he wanted to have conversations with somebody that represented the United States. And I felt then, as a, as a negotiator, that the stupidest thing that a government can do if it has a real problem with someone is to refuse to talk to them. And, and to let them simmer and, and to threaten them and build up animosity and fear in that country. And, and it's particularly applicable to a, an enclosed <coughs> society that's already paranoid to, to be further isolated and, and, and excused from direct talks with the people whom they fear. Also, I had some private conversation with some Chinese friends of mine. I normalized diplomatic relations with China back in 1979, and they, they were close to me, and they told me that they knew Pyongyang better than anyone else, and that was obvious, and that if the sanctions were declared by the United Nations, that the Korean people, North Korean people, would see, see this as a declaration that their nation was an outlaw nation and that their leader was a criminal and a liar. And they could probably accept the criticism of a nation, but, but you have to remember that Kim Il-sung was, was worshipped almost as though he was George Washington and Jesus Christ combined. He was, he was exalted as a, as a military, political, and spiritual leader. And to see him disgraced was something that the Chinese said they could not accept. Well, I knew that we could destroy North Korea militarily. Uh, with atomic weapons or even with conventional weapons. But the fact is that in the meantime, the North Koreans could have launched, I would say, more than 20,000 missiles and long-range shells on, on, uh, so on Seoul, which is not too far from the border. Well, I finally decided that, uh, that since the Clinton administration wouldn't move and have any talks, that I would uh, accept the invitation of Kim Il-sung. So I... I contacted the White House, and, and I did not get any encouragement, to put it mildly. <laughs> so I became increasingly concerned, and I finally met with Bob Gallucci. He came down the plains to our home on Sunday afternoon, I think on the 10th of June. And after he left, I was convinced that war was imminent. So I wrote President Clinton a letter and said, I have decided to go to North Korea, in effect, even without your permission. And uh, he was in Europe. It was the 50th anniversary <coughs> of, the, of the landing at, at Normandy. And uh, Al Gore, vice president, intercepted my letter. And he read it and said, I have decided to go. He said, he called me on the phone the next morning. And he said, Mr. President, if you'll just change that to I'm strongly inclined to go instead of I decided to go, I'll see if I can't get some, something to do. So, so he was going to call Clinton and Europe. And I said, don't clear it with the State Department, I know it will be vetoed. So he called President Clinton, called me back the next morning and said that President Clinton had given me permission to go. So we got a, a, a quick round of briefings uh, from, um, from CNN, for instance. Uh, I, I, got, I was a nuclear scientist, engineer in the Navy. I, I, I refreshed myself by having briefings from a, a professor at, at Georgia Tech to make sure I understood what the nuclear issue was. And uh, then we went to Washington to get some briefings there. And, and they turned out later to be absolutely and totally erroneous. There was nothing, 
There was nothing <laughs> accurate about it. So <laughs> I'm going to let you give, okay. give it. And then, so I decided to go. And, and we, we went, uh, we left less than a week after we had the Sunday meeting and, uh, and we got to Seoul and got to the DMZ and I'll turn it over now to Rosen. <laughs> <laughs> Who was impatient with my comments. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to interrupt him because we got briefings from everybody. We knew all of the issues. Jimmy had, we had a psychological um, thing about um, Kim Il-sung and, and the major people there. But um, when we went to Washington for that briefing, we had already had a briefing from our interns. And um, the, the, um, Jimmy had gotten CNN into North Korea. so. The interns had talked to CNN, Jim had, we had talked to them. Uh, Billy Graham had just been there. And so, we talked to Billy Graham, interns did. Well, the interns gave us a great briefing. We got to the CIA, and they started telling us about North Korea. And Jim and I kept looking at each other. <laughs> and finally, Jim said, where did you get your information? And they said, um, from South Korea and satellites flying over. We knew so much more than they did. It was just amazing. <laughs> And now you take it up in the DMZ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you ready to go to the next? <laughs> just, yes, any, uh, just let's let it, let it flow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got... Uh, um, every, every, I had heard so much about North Korea, and I, didn't, I was very nervous, and I think maybe everybody was walking with Jim. It was nice to have him, somebody we knew there with us, and, uh, and Marion. And so we got to the 38th parallel. Do you know what the 38th parallel, the symbol of it is? It's a piece of concrete about this wide go, strip that goes across from, did you see those barracks in the, in the oh. video? A piece of concrete, and that's the 38th parallel. And so we were standing there, it was very formal, and everybody was a little bit stiff. And Nancy Kinnick, a staff person, was with us, and she wanted to photograph. So she backed up a little bit to, to get us, and she put her foot over that on that concrete, <laughs> and she was picked up immediately in this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, it really kind of broke the ice. And uh, we, after that, everybody was a little bit more cordial. <laughs> that's, by the, by that's the way, story. this uh, trip from Pyongyang, I mean, to Pyongyang from Seoul, and then back over the DMZ, was the first time anyone had made that round trip in 41 years. Even when the Secretary General of the United Nations wanted to go to, so to Pyongyang, he had to go first to China, to Beijing, and then fly back in and to Pyongyang. But I, one of my provisos in agreeing to Kim Il Sung's invitation was that we cross the DMZ directly, and he agreed to that. So, but he didn't agree to it at first. No, not at first. <laughs> it was very reluctant agreement. But then we, we got in the car, Aaron and Rosa and I, in the cars, and we rode about 125 miles, I think it is, in a wide, wonderful superhighway with very few vehicles on it, up to uh, Pyongyang, where mm -hmm. we didn't know what in the world to expect. And I might say that in the book, the description of what we saw uh, came directly from Mrs. Carter's notes. I, I found that I slept most of the way, but <laughs> she and President Carter were wide awake and looking, and uh, President Carter was talking about all the political things, and Mrs. Carter, in addition, talked about what she was seeing out the windows and what we saw when we got into the Capitol. And thanks to her, some of that is in the book because uh, I, I got it from your notes, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, Jim, while we are now into North Korea waiting for meetings, what is the reaction back in South Korea and in Washington to the Carter trip to North Korea? Well, uh at, at, the, at a minimum, skepticism, <laughs> if not opposition. Um, there was a great deal of reluctance on the part of South Koreans to have President and Mrs. Carter go north, uh, partly because they were not part of a, a participant in it, but also because they didn't trust the north. It was the same sort of situation we have today. You, you don't deal with people you don't trust. So uh, President and Mrs. Carter were determined to go and prove that wrong. Uh, that was the situation in Seoul. In Washington, I think there was a skepticism and, and probably uh, dismissal. It was, uh, it, there, there was very little sense of optimism, I think, at any point. Uh, there was a good deal on our staff. We had met with President Mrs. Carter 
before they went across. And uh, we realized the gravity of the situation. But I have to point out that at that very time, while they were in North Korea, the United States was moving not only to get sanctions into the United Nations, which Kim Il-sung himself had said would mean war, but we were prepared, that is, the United States was prepared to begin serious augmentation of forces, which the North Koreans had said earlier, we watch Desert Storm, and we're not going to let you build up and then pop us like you did Iraq. We will hit first. And General Gary Luck and I were deeply concerned that the uh, movement uh, on the part of the United States toward that kind of heavy augmentation would precipitate something, regardless who was in North Korea. And that was going on at the very time you were in uh, North Korea. In fact, uh, the Thursday morning that in, in uh, Seoul time, Pyongyang time, uh, Gary Luck called me early in the morning, General Luck, and he said, I've got to see you immediately on the most urgent business. I said, I'll meet you at the office right away. He said, it's too secret. I can't come to the office. I'll come to your house. And we closeted. And he said, I just got a call from Washington. They are augmenting the forces, the very thing that you and I had said. We, he said, did you authorize this? I mean, did you agree to it? And I said, no, I didn't agree to it. And I knew he didn't agree to it. He said, well, this is impossible. I said, we've got 80,000 uh, civilians that we would have to be concerned about should the hostilities break out. Washington hadn't given you know, enough thought to that. And so he and I fired off a cable to Washington together. I think it's maybe the first time a master and a general signed the same cable. And they, we just said, this is premature. You must hold off on this until we can make proper plans to consider the evacuation, the, the, the uh, orderly evacuation of our of the civilians. By the way, before I went to North Korea, I also met with, with the president of South Korea, Kim Young Song, and also with General Luck, and, and, and Jim Laney was with us. But uh, the South Koreans were obviously quite skeptical, if not reluctant, for me to go. And, but General Luck said that he had been to the White House, to the ca cabinet room, a month or so before, and explained to the president and all of the key leaders in Washington that if North Korea attacked South Korea, that the casualties would be much greater than the total casualties in the first Korean War. So it was a very serious thing, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that major officials in Washington were contemplating a military attack on North Korea. Well, when we got there, we went to a beautiful um, uh, guest house, and then we began uh, negotiations with, with the North Korean leaders, not including Kim Il-sung, but his subordinates, and particularly the foreign minister, who was a really hard-line uh, official, determined not to back down at all. All he wanted to do was to con condemn the United States and the United Nations and so forth. And, and I knew thoroughly what I wanted to achieve. I had a list of 12 things, I, I hope just dreams of mine, that I wanted to see done. So I like, outlined those. And I have to say that at the end of that first afternoon of negotiations, Rosen and I were, were negotiating uh, together because uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why uh, Marion couldn't be there all the, all the way through. But, but uh, we, we ran into a stone wall. We didn't make much progress. And in the middle of the night, I woke up <coughs> distressed. And about, I think about 3 o'clock in the morning, Marion, I, I woke Marion up. And uh, I said, Marion, you need to go back to Panmunjom and so you can speak directly to Washington. And, and if we don't make any progress tomorrow morning when I meet with Kim Il-sung, you need to call Washington in order to stop the prospect of a military attack and see if the United States won't start direct talks with the North Koreans, which is what they wanted back in those two days too, and let Bob Gallucci maybe come to Pyongyang to do some talks about the nuclear issue. So this was all written out, and, and Marion left Pyongyang and went back to Panmunjom, and he stayed there until the next morning. Uh, and as soon as I met with, uh, when I got up the next morning, I met with Kim Il-sung uh, and his wife, and I found him to be completely uh, amenable to almost everything that we wanted. 
And this was in a private breakfast meeting. One of the things I asked for was to see maybe his son, Kim Jong-il. He said, Kim Jong-il doesn't meet with any foreign visitors. That's my role. Uh, and, but, uh, hmm. but, but he was very conducive. He let me know that uh, he was proud of his friendship with Billy Graham, that Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, was educated in Pyongyang, and that the Christians had helped save his life uh, earlier in his life. And so we went from there to meet with his uh, whole entourage across the table. Rosa and I were on one side with, with uh, Interpreter Christensen, right? right. And, and so we were negotiating for Rosa and I for, for the rest of the world, and we had Kim <laughs> Il-sung and his people on the far side. And, and I was really amazed at how much this man knew, this old man. He was 82. Uh, he was 82 years old. <laughs> 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 and, and every now and then, uh, if I asked him a question about the nuclear technology, he might turn and ask one of his people to, for a question, and before they would answer, they would, they would stand like this and look straight ahead, and they would answer his question and then sit down. They never looked at him, and, but he only had to do that on very few occasions. He knew what was going on. And, and as we went through the afternoon, I was very pleased at his agreement, first of all, to, to freeze their entire uh, nuclear program. Secondly, not to reprocess the fuel rods that were in the cooling tanks. Third, to let the international uh, energy inspectors come back and monitor everything they did. In addition, uh, he was willing to have uh, direct talks with America, and uh, those were the basic things that I had been uh, instructed that the United States wanted. I should add one thing before I turn it back over to Marion, and that is that I had zero authority. One of the provisos of the Clinton administration in letting me go was that I would not ever claim that I was speaking for the United States government, that I had to go as a representative of the Carter Center only as a private citizen. So I, I made it plain to the South Koreans that that was what I, what I my role. But I also made it plain that I would take their message back to the United States. And, and as, as things evolved, there were some other agreements that were worked out, but I'll reserve that to the next morning uh, when Marion re rejoined us. But af after that afternoon session, I was so relieved at the progress we had made that I sent word to Marion to come on back to Pyongyang. <clears throat> there was no need for him to go and, and, and deliver any message to Washington. Can I tell them a little bit about Pyongyang? Please, yeah, please. please. <clears throat> As we were driving, we went, Jim has had this huge, wide, uh, four-lane highway. Um, with, we, we'd been riding about one hour when we met a bus, and there were no <laughs> other vehicles. Um, and when we stopped halfway for refreshments and to rest. And we asked them about no cars, and they said, we don't have any luxury vehicles. We only make trucks, trains, and buses. Bus in mm -hmm. North Korea, so that's what you saw. You saw a lot of buses, and, and we rode on the subway. Um, but there were these big box-like concrete buildings, mm -hmm. just row after row after row after row before you got into the city. And then once you got into the city, it was incredibly beautiful, huge buildings. And I was riding along. I was in the car with an interpreter. And um, there was, it's hilly, and on a hill there was a statue that I don't know how tall it was. It was taller than this room, I know. Huge with uh, Kim Il-sung with his arm out. And I said, asked, I said to the uh, interpreter, who is that? And she said, that's the great leader. Well, that was a r really strange feeling because I knew they called him that, but just thinking about Jimmy, somebody saying, that's the great leader. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just don't do that at home. <laughs> See what I said? <laughs> Why is that so funny? tell you what I wrote about <laughs> You just don't do that at home. And she said, that's the great leader. <laughs> but this is one, and it was so beautiful. The buildings are massive and beautiful. This is what I wrote. Sculptures everywhere. Parks and water fountains abound with flowers. Roses in full bloom on bushes along the streets. And sometimes it would be a wall up to where the ground started with the, with the houses, with the buildings. And there would be roses trailing all over the wall. It was just incredible. Um, 
stretches of hollyhocks, gingo trees, and weeping willow. And then we went over a bridge over the Taidong mm -hmm. River. And um, there were roses and daisies and weeping willow. It was, it was just incredible, something totally different from what I had ever expected. At night, the city was all lit up and beautiful. That was for us, but they didn't do those flowers just for us. That's right. They didn't have time. <laughs> That's right. So it was, it was yeah. oh, and then when we went to the first meeting, um, you saw Jimmy with, with the foreign minister. The buildings, this building uh, was the General Assembly building, I think, seated 2,000 people. And they have about over 600 members of Parliament. We were Parliament. Parliament right. And, and uh, they meet two or three times two or three days, twice a year. <laughs> but um, also in this building, in the front of it, was a 40-foot statue of the great leader that everybody looked at as they sat in that seat. Mr. President, after you had your first session with Kim Il-sung, the real breakthrough session, uh, he did invite you the next day to have a, a, a cruise with him. But on well, that, no, that was really a surprise. He, yeah. he, he, that was a, very unusual. We were it told was. it never, it never happened. But between that first meeting and the cruise on Friday morning, you made a decision to announce on CNN to the world that you had reached some understandings uh, with Kim Il Sung. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, because quite. We, we later learned people in Washington were not totally pleased with that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I may not have the, the, the uh, sequence right, but I, I think I told Bob Gallucci that I was going to be on CNN, right. and he had no objection to it. Well, when, I, when Kim Il-sung left the meeting in the afternoon, maybe 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I, I had a follow-up meeting with the people who were his uh, staff and negotiators, one named Kong... Kong Sung Ju. It was, he was the uh, expert on nuclear power. And, and when I, I had made a very careful list of everything that Kim Il Sung promised to do, which is all we wanted, and I started going down that list of things, and sometimes uh, Kong would, would say, would start arguing with me. I said, Well, look, are, are you disputing the great leader? <laughs> And he would immediately back down. This happened three or four times. And then finally, finally, all of his staff, his foreign minister, his, his nu nuclear negotiator, everybody agreed with what Kim Il-sung had, had just uh, told me. And, and that's when we let Washington know that we had made great progress. And I informed Bob Gallucci, with whom I was talking on the phone, who had been designated to speak on, on, the, on the North Korea issue, that I was going to announce to CNN that we had made this progress. And Bob Gallucci said, OK. So, so we did that. And then we, we were hoping that we would see Kim Il-sung the next morning. And we were going to have breakfast, breakfast with him. And, and shortly before we left the, the uh, business house, which is a beautiful <coughs> place, like a dormitory, uh, we got word that he wanted us to go on a cruise. And it was a, a beautiful uh, cruise ship uh, with, uh, that belonged to, he said, kept telling us over and over, it belonged to his son, Kim Jong-il. But when you went on the main deck, it had a glass elevator that took you from the, from the main deck up to the second deck and, and, and then into the cabin where we stayed. So we began to, to uh, cruise up uh, down the river toward the seaport. And it was a, a, a long trip, and Marion was with us. So Marion and Rosa and I and Kim Il Sung and, and Kim Il Sung's wife were basically the ones sitting around the table. And I began then to ask him to do some more things. I, I wanted him to have a direct summit meetings with uh, with the president of South <coughs> Korea, Kim Jong Sung, and and he agreed. And, and I wanted him to to cooperate with the United States on on finding all of the missing Americans who are buried in North Korea. They're about estimated to be about 3,000 of them. At first, he, he hesitated about that. He wouldn't agree. And, and his wife finally said to him he should do it. So he said, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted him to have a uh, free, uh, free zone much wider than a de demilitarized zone to, to, to pull troops back so that his guns and missiles couldn't reach Seoul. He said he would do that if an equal amount of space was, was on the other side. And, and I suggested that, that he even have a, 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 a 
reduction in total military capabilities. He's had about a million uh, troops, uh, some of whom he said just did uh, work like building roads, and he said he would reduce those to 100,000 if, if the same thing happened on the, far, on the other side of the border. And I said, well, the United States only has 36,000. How about them? He said, if they just reduce that as the same percentage, that's all. So everything that he agreed to, to me, was, was, quite, was quite amenable and, and everything that we wanted. And then we finally reached the, uh, the end of, the, of a river. And, and he had built, he and his engineers had built a, a five-mile dam, a dam five miles w wide, all across the, the, where the river goes into the ocean to prevent salt water on high tide from coming in the river and, and making the, the river water salty so, so it couldn't be used for irrigation. And, and one of the things that, that impressed me, when we would, would go down the river, and he would see three uh, grain silos over, alongside the river. And he would tell me, uh, that, that was, those were built in, in, in 1973, and that first one is for soybeans, and the second one is for corn, and the third one is for wheat. And, and he, he, would, he would know how many school children were in every school building we saw. It was obvious that for 50 years, or so he had, he had meticulously managed every little detail mm. uh, of, the, of the life of, of, those, of those people. It was really an incredible voyage. And then at the end, he, he climbed a very steep hill that was probably, what, I'd say 100 feet high, mm -hmm. yes. so that you could look down on that, on that uh, five-mile wide river. And then that was, um, it was less than three weeks later that he died. And I was keeping notes, trying to write down everything Jimmy was saying, he was saying, and, and it can do it fairly easily if it's interpreted, which it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I also was trying to talk to his wife. And uh, <clears throat> so um, um, Jimmy and uh, the great leader started talking <laughs> about fish, fishing, <laughs> and about trout. And Jimmy was saying he was asking about the trout, and, and, they were, and you can tell him about it, but... I said to I ask her, do you fish? And she said a little bit, but I'd rather shoot. And I said, what do you shoot? Now, she, she's a big woman. She, she moved me physically all the time, so I would be in the photograph of where I was supposed to be. And, and she said, I said, well, what did you shoot? And she said, I shoot wild boar. They had told us they had this cabin up in the mountains. And, and she said, I shoot wild boar. I said, are you a good shot? She said, yes. I said, how many have you shot? She said, well, over 100. <laughs> and uh, I said, um, is um, the great leader, I don't know what else to call her. <laughs> is, is the great leader a, a good shot? And, and she didn't say nothing. I said, are you better than she, he is? And she, <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he saw her. And he said, she shoots, she told me she shot him with a rifle at long distance. He said, she shoots. Well, she aims, and I shoot them on the run. That's the reason she beats me. <laughs> it, was, it was just a fascinating trip. They were very interested in, in, in the future follow-up. I mean, it, it sounded like, naively, like, like peace almost. I told him that Rose and I were avid fly fishers, and he said, oh, we have trout in the northern part of our country. And he said, I, there's an interesting story. Let me tell you about it. He said, when I came back from exile, uh, the Japanese had been occupying our country, and, and he said, and, and destroyed it. Uh, he said, and I went up to the north, and the, and the uh, peasants up there were in the stream, and they were trying to kill all the trout. And, and I asked them why they were doing it. And they said, these are Japanese fish. We want to kill all these Japanese <laughs> fish. And he said, he said, I told them, no, that in 1905, there were American engineers in that area, and they had introduced brown trout. And I said, these are American fish, don't kill them. So, and he said, since then, I have increased the population of brown trout in those streams. And someday, Mr. President, I want you and your wife to come back and, uh, and do some fishing. And I still hope that before my time is out, that I'll be able to go up to North Korea. But didn't, in the he, part didn't of he want to um, have the American Fly Fishers Association? Yeah, he wanted, come I told over. him about the American Fly Fishing Association, and he wanted the fly fishers to come over and organize regular tourist, <laughs> regular tourist trips to North Korea. And I guarantee you, knowing fly fishermen, if they ever open up that area for fly fishing, they'll be inundated with people that want to go. Well, 
clearly the ones of us who had participated in the trip and had seen what President Carter had achieved were very excited when we would be coming back to South Korea and back to Washington. What we did not fully understand and appreciate was the reaction to the CNN interview the night before. And then there was a scene taken on the boat where it seemed as though President Carter, though giving his personal opinion, the sound bite came out and it looked like he said that the sanctions move had stopped. And uh, people in Washington took that as the former president announcing a new foreign policy. And so when we came back across the DMZ, there was Jim Laney. He was smiling, but it was something of a forced smile because he had some words for President Carter. Jim? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like a centurion, I was one under authority. <laughs> I, uh, first of all, I want to say they came back. We had gotten the word from CNN, and the relief in Seoul was palpable. Uh, at what President Carter had done and the fact that there might well be a, uh, a, a freeze on the, on the nuclear program, which, of course, was the bone of contention. So there was that as the basic thing. But after I got to the DMZ, uh, in our uh, headquarters up there, there is a secure phone. And uh, I had been up there a few minutes, and someone came out and said, the White House wants you on the phone. And so I went into the phone and turned out that there was a, a senior official in the White House that was calling to give me some instructions about uh, how I should uh, uh, greet President and Mrs. Carter and what I should do with them. <laughs> and uh, this was to instruct, I, 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 I uh, misspoke. Um, ask them, not instruct them, but ask them <laughs> to uh, return to Plains when they left Seoul, uh, not to come to Washington. First of all, President Clinton wasn't going to be there, and that uh, other people were away, and that there would be another time for a debriefing and, a, and so forth, a meeting. And I said, you know, this is insane. I mean, President Carter has maybe saved us from a war, and you're telling him to go to Plains. Uh, I know Plains is a great place. <laughs> Under the circumstances, it seemed inappropriate. Uh, but he said, well, those are the requests that I'm instructed to give you. So I thought, wow, that's... Uh, we got in the car, President Carter, Ms. Carter and I, driving back to Seoul, and I was trying to th find a moment where I thought it might be <laughs> propitious to break this news. And so I, I told him what, what, what the word I had. And uh, I'll let President Carter describe his reaction. <laughs> well, the first thing I did when I got back to Seoul was to go and, and tell uh, Kim Young sum the president, that, that President Kim Il-sung had agreed to a summit meeting. And then I went back to the front yard of the embassy residence, and we had a press conference. But before I could give the press conference, Kim young sum announced that he had accepted the invitation and there would indeed uh, be a, a summit meeting. He was thrilled at that, let me North say. Korea. Between North and South Korea, yes. That's right. Yeah, he, everybody was thrilled, I thought, until I, <laughs> until I found out what the uh, White House reaction was. But uh, then I had a, a secure phone conversation with uh, Al Gore, and it was one of those in things. In my house. <laughs> in, in your house, right, in, in the embassy home. And it, you, you've seen the Star Wars thing where the, where the voice comes over, you know, like a, like a tape recording. That's the way Al Gore sounded, and it didn't sound like the Al Gore that I knew, but he was obviously reading a message to me from President Clinton. They were very irate uh, at, at the deal that we had worked out. Well, to make a long story short, which I haven't done so far, we went, <laughs> <laughs> we flew, flew back, and when I arrived in, uh, I think, on, on the West Coast, I, I think in Portland, in Portland, Oregon, Portland. yeah, to, to transfer, I decided, although they were, I, I got a message there from uh, Tom Johnson at CNN, and, and he told me that, that someone in the State Department had, in effect, accused me of being a traitor. 
and of betraying the interest of my nation. And uh, I, was, I, I was very, obviously, distraught. So we decided that Rosen would go to Plains. <laughs> and, uh, and Marion and I would go to Washington because I wanted to get the, the situation straightened out. So we, we did. And when I arrived at the airport in Washington, uh, <coughs> nobody met me. Uh, I got to the White House. This is unbelievable. I got to the White House. They knew I was coming. Uh, I have secret, secret service with me. Nobody met me. Even in the, in the uh, reception room, nobody met me. And uh, I finally went up to uh, Tony Lake's office. And I gave Tony Lake, who was, uh, he was on national security. He was national, national security advisor. He was a national security advisor. Mm -hmm. And Bob Gallucci was there, I believe. Right. So I, I outlined, I think, all 12 things that the uh, North Koreans had agreed to do. <clears throat> and, and they didn't believe it. <laughs> they thought I was lying. And uh, President Clinton was not there. He was at, at the Camp David. He was at Camp David. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to him as a courtesy call. He said he was glad I was back <laughs> safely and that sort of thing. It was, it was not unpleasant at all. And then I, I had a meeting with, with some uh, news reporters and some friends of mine, Terry Adamson and others. And I outlined what we had done. And, uh, and then the, the next morning in the paper, I'm, I'm trying to rush through it, there was an expression of, of consternation about our trip and the fact that I was naive. Nobody met me. Even in the, in the reception room, nobody met me. And uh, I finally went up to uh, Tony Lake's office, and I gave Tony Lake, who was... Uh, he was on national security. He was national, national, national security advisor. He was a national security advisor. And Bob Gallucci was there, I believe. Right. So I, I outlined, I think, all 12 things that the North Koreans had agreed to do. <clears throat> and, and they didn't believe it. <laughs> they thought I was lying. And uh, President Clinton was not there. He was at, at the... He was at Camp David. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to him as a courtesy call. He said he was glad I was back <laughs> safely and that sort of thing. It was, it was not unpleasant at all. And then I, I had a meeting with, with some uh, news reporters and some friends of mine, Terry Adamson and others, and I outlined what we had done. And, uh, and then the, the next morning in the paper, I'm, I'm trying to rush through it, there was an expression of, of consternation about our trip and the fact that I was naive, that I didn't know what had happened, that I just dreamed of what Kim Il Sung would agree, and I had brought that a false message back to the White House. It, it was in, incredible. So, so I decided, in, back in Plains, that I would send a message to uh, Kim Il Sung with a list of all 12 things that he had agreed to do and ask him to confirm those not to me, but to the, but to President Clinton. I think this was on Sunday. That was the Sunday. On morning. Sunday, mm -hmm. and so it took obviously a while for the message to go to North Korea and uh, embassy and, and over over to uh, Pyongyang. And I was on the way back to the Carter Center Wednesday morning, and Marin called me <coughs> and said that Kim Il Sung had agreed to every single one of those twelve issues in a letter to Clinton. And he sent me a copy of the letter. So, so everything that we wanted was worked out. And, and the Clinton administration very quickly, to their credit, followed up with an agreement for bilateral discussions, freeze the nuclear program, let international inspectors come in and observe it. They would not reprocess any, uh, any nuclear fuel. Uh, there would be a, uh, summit meetings between the North Koreans and and South Korea, that, that we would follow up with, with a, a hope and expectation that the heavy sanctions on North Korea could be lifted, uh, that there would be no uh, sanctions effort passed through the United uh, Nations, and that ultimately, if, if North Korea 
kept its part of the bargain that the United States would work toward normal relations with, uh, with North Korea. Everything that you could possibly want, all of those things were confirmed by the Clinton administration and by North Korea, and by then I was completely uh, out of it. And, and, that, and, that, and that continued. One of the things that, that Kim Il-sung asked me to do, he said he would shut down his old nuclear reactor that, that produced the kind of fuel that you could make plutonium out of. But he would, but he would need some uh, electricity because they were going to shut down the power plant, the nuclear power plant. So part of the agreement that I worked out, also that I didn't mention earlier, was that we would provide North Korea with enough fuel oil to produce electricity from a diesel plant, and, and that the United States and China and Japan and South Korea would, would all get together and build them two modern nuclear plants that wouldn't produce the kind of fuel that you could make plutonium out of. All that was agreed later by President Clinton in just a few weeks, and it was confirmed uh, with the North Koreans. And, and that was a way that, that uh, President Clinton left the, left the situation when, when he left the White House. It was a completely harmonious relationship uh, with the North, North Koreans. With inspection. With inspection and, and with everything. And then shortly after that, the situation was changed dramatically. And that has led to what we have today. In 2002. Just a quick point because we, I want to have a, a, a participants to say a little word about what's going on today and then we do have to want to save some time for questions. Simply to say that the agreed framework that President Carter <coughs> mentioned, signed in October of 1994, lasted until December of 2002. And despite what you may be hearing and reading, North Korea did not produce one nanogram of plutonium between October 1994 and December of 2002. When that agreement fell apart with fought on both sides, uh, North Korea then kicked out the inspectors, <coughs> left the nuclear nonproliferation treaty, seized the uh, uh, fuel that had been, uh, the spent fuel that had been under IAEA inspection, Recranked up its north its, its uh, reactor, and most people believe that since 2002, North Korea has accumulated enough plutonium for somewhere between six to ten nuclear weapons. There, of course, was very different policies between one time and another time. And so, what I'd like to do is to ask our participants now: Are there lessons from 1994? that should have been learned and should be being applied today. Can I say something for Yes, sir. Because I think that um, it wasn't, wasn't Kim, uh, Kim the great leader. Kim Il -sung. Yeah. Kim Il -sung. <laughs> wasn't he getting ready for the meeting with the uh, head of South Korea definitely. when he died, which was just a few, yeah. and think what might have happened if he had lived. Yeah. It just makes yeah. you really well, sad about what's going on today. As, as soon as the new administration came into Washington, I won't call any names, <laughs> there, there was a, uh, a very rapid change in, in the attitude toward North Korea. And within the next year or so, the entire agreed framework was rejected. And North Korea was branded as an axis of evil. And we invaded another country that was called an axis of evil. And there were statements made in Washington by very high-level people that we should attack uh, North Korea. There was a military threat against uh, North Korea. And it was in, in, the, in that environment, obviously, with, with all of the previous agreements rejected, that North Korea announced in advance that they were going to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty restraints, they were going to reject the previous agreements that they had reached, and they were going to start reprocessing fuel. So they, they let it be known in advance, and all they had, had asked for was direct bilateral talks and an assurance from the United States that we have no intention of attacking North Korea, provided North Korea lives peacefully with its neighbors, that is, South Korea, and, uh, and, and China. 
That, that, that's what, that's all they have asked for. And, and we have not been, the United States has not been willing to do either one of those two things, either have bilateral talks with them on the major issues or to agree officially that we will not attack them. The United States, as you know, has said we will only deal with North Korea as part of a six-nation meeting. We agree to have some bilateral talks with them there, but since then, of course, the, the alien nation has become increasingly difficult. And now we have the North Koreans already have exploded one nuclear uh, weapon, uh, one nuclear bomb. Weapon. I might point out that although the United States has claimed that North Korea was reprocessing uranium, through a very slow, tedious process that I know intimately, I was deeply involved in it when I worked on Admiral Rickover, they, they just announced today that all of the material in the bomb exploded was plutonium and, and not, had nothing to do with uranium processing. Jim? One of the lessons that I think that, that so it came so clearly when President Carter was met such doubt and um, all at the White House and in the government State Department is how we're imprisoned by our stereotypes. How we just, we, particularly when we demonize, we can't believe that that you can actually deal with another party, that they are totally evil, they need to be destroyed or rejected or whatever. That may be the case, but this proves to me that we need to ensure that we've taken every possible opportunity to break a log jam, that we have explored every option before we give up and uh, walk away. And the, the great thing about this visit was that President Carter had the vision and the courage to go there. As, as uh, John said earlier, it was an international high wire with no safety net, which is unbelievable. And to achieve with Kim Il-sung, whom people had thought was uh, the Satan incarnate, uh, the agreements that had worked until 2002, when once again the stereotypes reasserted themselves demonized and no longer can work with them. Now the question today is, and it's, it's on us, why is it impossible for us to talk directly with North Korea one-on-one -on -one at the highest level in order to find out if we can't resolve the problem? Now that is not appeasement, it's not being a wimp, it's not doing anything, it's, it's, it's simply being sensible. And if it doesn't work, you've always got the option, you know, you can always fall back on that. But to use it as a first uh, option to me is insane. And, I, you know, I think the country, and I'm sure I speak for all of us, uh, owes an incalculable debt uh, to the Carters for that trip, which uh, was really of enormous historic importance. Well, I like it. Tonight, just one footnote, and, and I'll be through. Uh, Rose and I were, were fishing in, in Canada just a few months later after Kim Il Sung died, and we got a personal letter from Kim Jong Il, his son, assuring me that he would uh, comply with all the agreements that his father had uh, concluded. So I sent that message down to the White House to just to inform them, and as you know, subsequently there were direct. Uh, summit meeting between Kim Jong-il and, uh, and Kim Dae-jung, and uh, so much progress was made in having peace on the Korean Peninsula that Kim Dae-jung won the Nobel Peace Prize for that progress. All of that has now been thrown in the wastebasket. Well, obviously, we would like to continue talking. We could talk for all night. But it is time to uh, turn to John and have the questions. And so thank you for letting us talk to you and with you. And now we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Marion, very, very much. I didn't want to come up and interrupt. I was under my orders to get up here at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and you were doing so well. We could have gone all evening. But we'll do as many of the 20 questions or so which have come in from the audience as we can quickly. And the first one I think was best perhaps directed to President Carter. And that is simply. Do you think uh, war over Korea is more or less likely today than it was in 1994? I really think it's, I, I haven't thought about that before. I really think it's less likely now. I, I, I thought that when we went over in June of 1994 that war was, was absolutely imminent. That, that if the UN passed that 
sanctions, condemnation of the nation and, and its leader, that North Korea would respond immediately with an attack on South Korea. And, and I might say that that opinion of mine was shared by General Gary Luck, who told me the same thing. And the Chinese friends of mine told me the same thing. I think now that the sanctions passed by the United Nations, which are very mild, by the way, uh, compared to what Marilyn Madeline Albright outlined on television that you saw a while ago, th those sanctions are very mild. And as you know, that, that most of the sanctions that have been announced are, are not going to be uh, enforced by either say, the Chinese or South Korea. So I think they, they won't be in war right now. Well, let's hope. And um, perhaps related to this is a question that may be directed to Ambassador Laney because he, after all, is a specialist on Korea, and it sort of has a, a dimension to it about the leadership of Kim Jong-il. Um, what, in reality, would UN sanctions against North Korea accomplish, if anything? Well, I think after uh, the uh, North Koreans uh, exploded their, made their test of this nuclear device, against really all of the, uh, uh, against the uh, urging not to do it by every country in the world practically, that there was, they felt this was an affront. There had to be some response and the sanctions were a response to that. But I think that having said that, that does not preclude the possibility in due course, which I hope would not be too far in the future, of our talking directly with them. Uh, but sanctions yeah. never have worked. Either. Oh, I, in terms of the effect of sanctions, sanctions have never achieved their purpose. The Senate, the Senate committee has looked at all that in all history, and they just don't work. Threats like that just simply are mostly ineffective. Um, so we, it, the sanctions satisfy the world for punishment, but they don't do much in order to achieve the goal, which is to try to change behavior. There's another element here, and that's a religious element. Part of a, of a North Korean, you might say, quote, religion, is Juche. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it, J-U-C-H-E, which means self-reliance. Juche. Juche, okay. So, so when, when the outside world imposes on them sanctions, this increases their commitment to Juche or self-reliance, that we can get along by ourselves. Mm. And, and when I noticed when Kim Jong-il announced that they had that their nuclear explosion had been successful. He said, without any outside help, we North Koreans ourselves did this. So they're very proud of that, of that uh, ability to live without outside help. And they're totally isolated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a question that may be appropriate for Mrs. Carter. It, it notes that while you're special advisor to your husband, you also do an awful lot of mental health on your own. North Korea is very hard for, for us to understand. And I just wonder, according to this question, whether or not you have any views on the psychology of North Korea and the kind of people you met, including what role women may have in that society. Did you pick up any insights? Well, I was told by my interpreter, who was a nice young woman who had a little three-year-old little boy and um, husband, and she, one of the things she said, before I forget it, is that all men should be Christians because they would be better to their wives. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the women work from, uh, work eight hours every day, six days a week, and everybody does. And um, that's the re reason she was telling me this, was talking about Billy Graham, and she had become a Christian. And um, she said that on, on Sundays, the men go to church, but the women have so much to do because they've been working all week. Yeah. But they do work hard. Um, and um, I don't know about the average North Korean woman. I think they're all just burdened. Uh, but um, the great leader's wife was very powerful and had a lot of influence on us. But I don't know whether any of the rest of them do or not. But they are, as Jimmy said, they, they have no connection with the outside world and they just live their own life. And, um, and I imagine there's a lot of mental health problems there. Mm -hmm. They don't but I, there's any way to know. They don't respond positively to threats and intimidation and punishment. You know, the, the best way to drive them toward more nuclear programs is to threaten them militarily to insinuate that you want to have a change in the regime, that is, get, get rid of Kim Jong-il. 
uh, and, and impose additional punishment on the country. I, I think that just drives them further away from, from any sort of accommodation. That's my only uh, This young woman did tell me that um, um, she, the, the, after, after everybody got off from work, there was no curfew. Mm. And that they went in, now whether this is true or not, I don't know, but they went into, they, they drank a lot of beer and they caroused around. And she said her husband used to like to go out at night with the men and, and drink beer. But that um, she didn't like for him to do that. So see, she had a little control. <laughs> and so she said, now we stay at home. And we, after dinner, we get our beer and we sit at the table in the dining room. And we have some juice for the, for the little boy that looks just like the beer. And we... Have a good, she said, this is the best part of my life. <laughs> this is a question I think to all panelists, uh, just as general. Do you favor bilateral or, or the current Six Nation talks with North Korea? Do you have a choice, I guess? Well, or is it I, both? I think in order for the Bush administration to save face, that the bilateral talks, which I certainly do favor, are just about going to have to take place within the framework of a Six Nation uh, meeting. But, but that would certainly be possible, and it ought to be done uh, with a high-level representative and, and on a sustained basis, and, and not just like it has been in the past, meet for 30 minutes and just throw epithets at each other. So I think bilateral talks, yes, maybe under the framework of a Six Nation uh, meeting. There's well, a related well, question, well, which I think is also to you, President Carter, since you've done so much to normalize relations with China. What is China's role in this? Um, what are the characteristics, a uh, 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 participant asks, of the North Korea that China would like to see? What kind of a North Korea would China like to see, and do you have an impression of that? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that, that China wants a stable uh, North Korea. They, they, they don't want the entire country to come apart uh, politically or militarily or economically because they have a long border with North Korea, as you all know, and they don't want a, a massive flood of immigrants coming in, uh, into China. That's one thing. And you have to also remember that uh, every time uh, Kim Jong-il has wanted to do so, he has gone to uh, China to have very harmonious and mutually constructive meetings. He's, he's analyzed, according to the news reports, their system of uh, free enterprise, maybe to implement a little bit of it step by step in, in his own, own country. And, and I think that China has made it plain that uh, just like one of President Bush's uh, signing statements, when the Congress passes something that he doesn't like, he signs it, but he says, but I won't do this. I think that's exactly what the, what the Chinese have done with this latest United Nations resolution. They say, we'll sign it, but we're not going to inspect ships at sea. We're not going to do anything that might be looked upon as, as a military threat uh, to North Korea. So I think the Chinese are very uh, careful about preserving the political structure that's in North Korea. There's no doubt in my mind, though, that they would like to see an alleviation of a nuclear threat. And they have made it plain over and over, privately to me and publicly even, that they strongly favor the United States having direct bilateral talks with North Korea. Everybody does. There's another question, um, which I think is directed to you, sir. What is the connection, if any, between the response of the international community to North Korea and the unfolding situation in Iran? Well, the, the connection there is, is, is basically negative. You know, the first thing I said tonight was that, that, that one of the things that, that I deploy is, is refusal to talk to people who disagree with you. And, and I think that now, uh, after we have uh, invaded Iraq, which was a horrible mistake, and after we abandoned Afghanistan and, and the search for uh, Osama bin Laden and, and the war against al-Qaeda in order to go into Iraq, we, we now have, have confirmed the policy of not talking to people who disagree with us. So we don't talk to Syria. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk to Hezbollah. We don't talk to, to others who disagree with us. And I think what the Iranians have seen now is that uh, the only way to, to prevent the United States from taking military action is to have a nuclear device of your own. And uh, we took military action against one of the access of evil, access of evil, that was North Korea. I mean, that was uh, Iraq. We, we didn't take military action against North Korea. And I think the Iranians see here that if we have an uh, atomic uh, capability, the United States won't attack us. But, but I think to, to threaten military action against countries that are already isolated and already branded 
is the worst possible way to achieve our goals of, 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 of nuclear nonproliferation and harmony in either Asia or the Middle East region. How do you answer critics who say it's hypocritical that the U.S. can have nuclear weapons but North Korea cannot? <laughs> uh, that's Dr. Lane's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no name on the question. No name on the question. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a book last year, not, not nearly as good as Marianne's book, but uh, mine was called Our Endangered Values. And I outlined there the, the somewhat superficial uh, attitude of the United States on nuclear weaponry. The fact is that our country has either abandoned or disavowed every single nuclear arms control agreement that has been negotiated by every president since Dwight Eisenhower. There, there are no nuclear arms control agreement still binding on the United States. And, and this doesn't send a, a good message to other nations who are contemplating taking this major and, and very negative step. Uh, every year, every five years, we have a meeting here at the Carter Center in, in this same place. And, and the ones we meet with are about 30 countries all of whom have the capability of developing nuclear weapons. And, and that includes uh, nations like Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Argentina and Brazil and Chile and others that have the technological capability and the, and the financial capability of developing nuclear weapons, and they have chosen not to do so. And, and one of the main repositories of their faith is a nonproliferation treaty. And every five years is a reassessment of a nonproliferation treaty and every time now, the last three times, including 2005, the, the, the whole assumption is that the United States is a major violator of a nonproliferation treaty. And, and so our country does not send a clear signal of, of uh, restricting nuclear weapon development. In fact, this, this last, this year, uh, as you know, the United States agreed to, uh, the government has agreed to, to provide almost an unlimited amount of nuclear fuel to India, which has refused to, to sign the nonproliferation treaty, which I think is another mistake. So I, I don't approve, as you can see, of our, of our policy on nuclear arms control. We only have time, I'm afraid, for one more question. It's almost 8.30, and the question is that one I'm not surprised is asked, and probably others have thought the same thing. Could you negotiate again with North Korea as you did in 1994? I think as far as the North Koreans are concerned, uh, they would be willing. <clears throat> Jim Lenny would probably know this better than I. <clears throat> but I, I don't think there's a, a chance in, in the world that the, uh, <clears throat> that the U.S. government would, would approve either I or anyone else negotiating with the North Koreans. <clears throat> I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times last week and suggested maybe somebody like uh, Jim Baker uh, might might be one to to negotiate maybe in private, but I think in 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 retrospect the the best chance is going to be for the United States to negotiate under the umbrella of the six person talk, and that would have to be an official of the U.S. government, and not somebody like Jim Baker or William Perry, who is also an expert on the uh, Korean. I don't think the United States government is going to permit any outsider. To negotiate. I know everyone will be disappointed, <laughs> but I'm afraid unless there are further comments, I have to bring this to a close. That was sort of preemptive, wasn't it? Preemptive <laughs> strike. Could I just make one or two more announcements, please? I appreciate the applause, and I know our, our panel do, but I need to thank them. My instructions are to please offer them thanks for this wonderful evening. That's um, President and Mrs. Carter and Dr. Marion Creekmore and Dr. James Laney. Uh, I also want to thank the guests for coming. Uh, I want to let you all know that there are still copies of Marion Creekmore's book outside that you can purchase and copies of President Carter's op-ed piece and an op-ed piece which was done by one of the inspectors to give you a sense of the argument. So we're trying to be helpful and if you fail to buy one of Marion's books today here, you can buy them at the Carter 
museum library, along with a selection of President Carter's books, Endangered Values, start a book club for the holiday season for all your friends and neighbors and relatives. I urge you to do so. And please, if you'd like to join our third conversation, which is December 6th, it will be here at the Carter Center, a panel led by uh, Karen Ryan, our Director of Human Rights, called Declaring Human Rights. And it will discuss the state of human rights in the world, how the international community can help human rights defenders and those who are trying to pressure their government to do the right thing. Thank you very, very much for being with us tonight. This has been a wonderful occasion, and good night. <laughs>